Ryan Stanton here with a sub front line today. A special guest. Interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll lay out the um, story about how it all happened uh, here soon. Uh, but uh, talking uh, with Dr. Marvin Wayne, and um, we. So I'm going to set the stage. You know, I'm we're at ASEP 23 in Philadelphia, and I'm upstairs just trying to grab a little coffee, a little breakfast before we head down to do meetings and uh, and um, and. Dr. Bacata, Rick Bacata was up there and says, I need you to meet a guy. And I said, all right, let's go over there and meet a guy. And so Marv was over there at the table and met him. And uh, we started talking about cookies and catheters and all kinds of things and EMS and motorsports. And I thought, man, we got to get you on the podcast because heck of an interesting story um, and a life in emergency medicine. So uh, here we are today recording now that we're all back uh, safely at our homes uh, after ASAP 23 and having the opportunity to talk after running through a little bit of technical difficulties as this happened since COVID with Zoom. And so now we're recording here and uh, appreciate him joining us. So um, give me a little bit of background on yourself and we'll roll from there. Okay, so I, I, I'm from Detroit. I was born in Detroit longer ago than most of your parents or grandparents maybe. Um, I actually will turn 80 in December. Um, and uh, long story, inner city, uh, went to Mumford High School, which was famous for some of my graduate in my class, Jerry Bruckheimer being one, um, and uh, worked my way through school, went to the University of Michigan. Uh, couldn't afford the last year because my father died. I uh, wasn't sure what to do. So I just said, hell, I got nothing else to do. But I'll just apply to medical schools after three years. Uh, got rejected, including the University of Kentucky, by 16 schools, um, put on the waiting list at the University of Michigan. I think that was out of c- caution and, and conscience. Um, spent every Monday morning dropping off a letter to the dean of admissions saying, I want to be a doctor. You can make it help, make it happen, <clears throat> bringing candy, of course, to his secretary. Um, I'm not that dumb. Um, and three days before class uh, called me up, uh, said, hey, we got an opening. Do you want it? I said, you betcha. So I graduated medical school in 68. I finished actually early. I did a fellowship in England for six months, actually five and a half um, at St. Bartholomew's Hospital. Um, later became a fellow of the Royal Society of Medicine. Side effect. Um, went on to a surgical residency in Colorado. Then I had a very planned deferment. So I guess get to get lucky and go to Vietnam. I uh, was a trauma surgeon in Vietnam at 24th Evacuation Hospital. Are you getting bored already? Um, and um, then uh, went back to Fort uh, Carson in Colorado Springs for my second year. So somewhere in that first year, I had gotten engaged before I left uh, and decided to get married on a medevac. So I flew back to Boston. <clears throat> so we had three days to arrange a wedding, got married. We've now been married all, uh, what, 52 plus years. and. Um, I went uh, then said hi, goodbye, went back to Vietnam, uh, completed my time there as, Colorado, as I said, back to Fort Carson, Colorado Springs. And uh, we, uh, from there, uh, said, hey, I got to figure this out. So I decided to do a fellowship year in surgery to get a sense of where I wanted to go. Um, so I applied and ended up in Seattle at the Mason Clinic, Virginia Mason Medical Center. Best thing or worst thing I ever did. So when I was in Colorado Springs, um, the only thing good that came out of the Army for me, well, a lot of experience, obviously, um, was I paid off almost all of my medical school and other debt. Uh, and then I moonlighted in the EDs in Colorado Springs at the time, kind of got a taste of emergency medicine. Of course, obviously, wartime is pure emergency medicine, along with a little bit of a few other chaos. Um, and then said, oh, great, I'm in Seattle. Going to love this year didn't, couldn't make up my mind what the hell I wanted to do. So I said, hey, I better think about this. Migrated up to a little city called Bellingham. <clears throat> We're hundred miles north of Seattle. About 35,000 when I got there, about another 40, 50 in the county. Now we're a quarter of a million. You know what happens with growth. Um, and so that little bit of one year will be 50 years in January. Uh, got involved in trans- translating. Remember, I want to emphasize something. There is no I and we. So all the I things you say should be we things. We do things together. Um, And got involved with the EMS community that was trying to get rid of a 
substandard being a kind word, uh, ambulance system, evolved to our medic system, which again will be 50 years next year. And they've been dragged along and work as the medical program director for the city and county. We have about 700 EMS providers who are like my children. They're good days, bad days, and oh my God, what the hell am I doing today? Uh, days. And um, we've grown. We serve uh, the area of a quarter of a million. We have a lot of transient population from Canada to the north. We even have a, an area called Point Roberts, which is a peninsula of Canada that goes below the 49th parallel. So we really want should have given it back to Canada, um, but we didn't. And um, now we have to try to go through Canada for care, or we fly, or we boat, or whatever. And we had to create a corridor through Ottawa and Washington, D.C. You know, all the fun that goes on. We also have San Juan Islands. So a lot, a lot of interesting things. So we are a integrated city-county system, BLS-ALS. We've gone to a lot of BLS transport. Uh, we've done a lot of unique things, like our BLS agency that's close to the mountain, to the ski area has nitrous oxide, for example. So we don't do pain management ALS trips to the mountain, which is a long way. Um, on Baker Ski Area. Um, great area, lots of snow. Grooming is a dirty word, so understand that. The, um, the nitrous is a lot that once you get below 1,500 feet, you can start providing analgesia. So you, again, analgesia at the mountain, come on down and, and go from there. So it's cut our ALS responses. We've been doing RSI for many, many years. We use video laryngoscopy. We studied end tidal CO2 all the way back because our first paper was in 95 in annals and our second paper was in 97. Again, when many of these people might not have even been born um, and was in New England Journal in 15 minutes of fame. And on, on we go from there. So now we've got this amazingly integrated, interesting system. I spent 46 years, I guess, almost seven years working in the ED also. I now do some ICU research consulting on post-arrest care. So I'm like Dr. Annoyance up there. Um, now they, they become tolerant. They just go, it's a little short old guy there and we'll be nice. Um, and to help direct EMS with lots of other wonderful people. So let's talk about being early, you know, early into EMS. And, you know, because EMS and emergency medicine as a profession really kind of developed together at about the same time. And you have a story that's very common for that era where, you know, whatever the initial training you came from, in your case, surgery, uh, and then heading over to Vietnam and then transitioning to emergency medicine. Talk about those early days with that really kind of incubation of emergency medicine and EMS more to what we see today and the progression over the years that you've done it. Well, theoretically, <clears throat> the old saying was people working in the ED were either surgeons with the shakes or cardiologists that lost their hearing um, or somebody who couldn't get an honest job. And that was truly the concept. Um, and so when I started working up here in Bellingham, we had two hospitals. So we had a hospital war that went along with it. Um, and, and, you know, it was, you know, one group would get fired this month, another group the next month. Uh, stability only came later. And the concept when I went around, you know, traveling, whatever, they'd say, well, what do you do? I said, I'm an emergency physician. And they would go, what's that? Uh, an orderly? Uh, I don't know. That may have been not quite, but some people were, were that unkind. So I used to often say I was, I'm, I, I'm a surgeon in advance. Um, because, of course, surgeons were like really cool people though, in those days. Um, and that's when they actually operated and didn't pontificate. So we, you know, we, it began to evolve. So I actually took the first boards uh, in 1980. Um, the day I took my orals was May 18th, 1980, which also was a very auspicious day. I think I got the date right. That was the day Mount St. Helens blew. And I was in Chicago. And my compatriots here were, were telling me, calling me, whatever, in those days, carrier pigeon of what had happened. I'm in Chicago. So anyway, I have great pictures that people say. I think I still have a jar of St. Helens ash in my basement that a friend over in Yakima sent me as a, a holiday gift. Um, whatever. Uh, so, but I'm back back now. So I'm in Bellingham, 
We're trying to get this EMS system going. We've got um, fire districts. We had 19 fire districts at the time. We had the city. Uh, the first group was interesting. So we had this private ambulance service. So we put the, well, let's go back for a sec. We put together a group of local people who said, whoa, the ambulance system that we have now called Crown Ambulance, and I think we're beyond statute of limitation for them to sue me. Um, they were actually killing people. The taxi cab was the safest way to the hospital. So we put together a group of people to try to, again, arrange, understand, create. And then one day, Crown just called up and said, we're out of business. You're screwed. Just thinking we'd come back, you know, begging to them. But with forethought, uh, Billingham Fire had trained 10 of their firefighters as EMTs. And we took those 10 EMTs. We borrowed an ambulance. One, there used to be a Nike base to protect us from being attacked up north in Blaine, Washington on the U.S.-Canadian border. Um, and also we borrowed an ambulance from one of the rural communities that had one. And in two hours went into business. And subsequently now, you know, we're doing 31,000 dispatches and we see lots of sick people and we've developed a BLS ALS tiered response with uh, five ALS units, an ALS supervisor, um, and then uh, about 40 transportable BLS vehicles, uh, city and county. And now we've just put on two only BLS city units because our volume, we've got a community paramedic program, uh, working on integrated health care, working on Suboxone. Uh, we have a Narcan giveaway program. We've trained a thousand people in Stop the Bleed and Narcan. Um, we do CPR training. Um, we've still come up stagnant on our ALS survival from out of hospital cardiac arrest at about 13% go home neurologically intact all rhythms, which may sound great to some people. To us, it needs to be better. So we're sitting here and you've, uh, other than that being a fantastic excuse for missing the largest uh, volcanic eruption in modern history in the continental United States, that was great, an excuse of the board exam. Um, great work there, uh, especially for the home state uh, action that was there. Um, as, you, as you've gone through this evolution and what, as you've experienced, you know, from your side as a physician, you, mean, you talked about the EMS and the emergency medicine, and of course, still we we still get this. You know, what are you going to do when you grow up, or what are you going to do when you graduate in emergency medicine? So it hasn't completely changed yet. You know, what have you seen in terms of the changes as your viewpoint as a physician of emergency medicine and EMS during that time? Well, it's it's very interesting because they do have a, a parallel track to them. Okay, very parallel. So EM, as I said, I took the first boards in 1980. I actually started doing emergency medicine uh, part time and, and then, you know, uh, finishing up my fellowship year, uh, 1973, 74. Um, and then uh, obviously since then, uh, at, in the beginning with the first EM residencies, um, we began to see some acceptance. We weren't just the surgeon, the shakes, the cardiologist with hearing issues or the doctor that couldn't get a real honest job. We began to see residents coming out that were well-trained, understood, and had the desire to treat patients. As that evolved over time, the residencies grew. I, I don't know what the current number is, but the number is large. And other than the fact that in the last year or two, we've had a decreased interest in those residencies, and we can talk why, because I think there's a very clear pathway of to why, um, it's been a very popular specialty. So as that moved along, ambulance systems began also to move along. They went from the uh, era of, again, uh, you know, the taxi cab, the, the mortuary. So they had the embalming fluid on one side, the IV fluid on the other, um, or Joe's favorite ambulance. As fire-based EMS began to get more involved. Now, as Firebase got more involved, uh, the sheer number of participants with training got involved. So, for example, I said we have 700 EMS providers at the EMT and ALS level in this county. Many of them are part of a, a fire, all our fire departments, for the most part. All the participants are EMT level or higher. And then they have a lot of extra training we can talk about another time. 
um, the evolution of that somewhat parallel because as the EM residencies turned out well-trained people, some of them came from systems that had, uh, you know, as they say, pretty good community training. Some of them didn't. And they were seeing, wow, they're bringing me in these patients and they're terribly uh, prepared to bring to me. They're, they're not, their airways aren't being managed or their bleeding isn't being stopped or whatever. So those same residents, as they evolved out of their residencies, began to either go back to where they were or go elsewhere and say, hey, we got to do this better. So um, NEMSP, for example, is 40 years old uh, next year. Uh, we started in 84, now in 2024. I actually was somewhat involved in that first group. Never quite made it to that meeting in Hilton Head because my plane got mechanically out uh, and never got down with Ron Stewart, who was my idol and actually helped me in many ways. In fact, when he was in Los Angeles is where that key occurred. But back to the issue. So as people came out of training, a training program that said EM is real, and as we began to get our first board certifications, 1980 was the first board, as that occurred, and as those numbers began to grow, as the level of training began to grow, as the breadth of the training. So we moved from standard EM training, to EM training with critical care, to EM training with focused care, ultrasound, um, now EMS. So we have EMS fellowships that have expanded. So we, we went in from an infancy of, again, the surgeons with the shakes, the cardiologists couldn't hear, and those that couldn't find an honest job to train people. That number began to grow. And that, with that growth uh, came specificity, better training, better procedural training, and better educational and knowledge training. So we evolved from, as you know, I used to say, from the, the club and the rock uh, and, and maybe the, then we got the wheel and now the wheel got hooked to a cart and now the cart had a driver and now the back of the cart had a, had a, had a, a slab to put people on. And now the back of the cart, now you have the slab to put people on, but people that take care of the people on the slab, we did that same pathway occurred in, uh, in, uh, EMS. And I'm, you know, I'm the old fart in, the, in EMS. Um, I've been around a long, long time. I may be up there with the, the longest active EMS medical directors, but that's okay. Um, you know, I'm proud of what we have, we, again, emphasizing the word we have done, but also I'm building to the future. I have a, another physician who eventually that will kick me out. He's as tall as I am short. So we call ourselves the twins, uh, Danny and Arnold. Um, and we're working to grow our program and we're happy. I mean, we have our own training program, for example. We train our own paramedics and train for other areas. So that's kind of the, the evolutionary background. So whether you're, you know, you've known uh, Marvin Wayne in the past or not, you've probably been, you've probably been involved with something he's done. Um, and so give us some background on the, I, th I think when I walked up, one of them called you pigtail, um, pig or pigtail. And is so the the Wayne catheter uh, with the pigtail. Give us a background on that, on something that most of us use in our emergency departments on some frequency. Well, we can talk about that. We can even go back further to the AED story. Um, that I actually I think that's more interesting, but we'll get to it. Um, so uh, I worked with a gentleman named Norman McSwain, Max Wayne, as Norman used to say, down in New Orleans. Um, for many years, I we met when we were on an accreditation body for uh, EMS training uh, and got to be fast friends. Um, and and Norman had this idea of putting in finding a better way to put a chest tube in. So worked with him in developing a mushroom catheter. In other words, it went in, we pulled it, it flanged out, stayed in. It was still pretty stiff, and it was still you know kind of uh, uh, potentially damaging to the lung. So. Uh, as an evolution of that, I got with a friend who worked with Cook Critical Care. And I said, Charlie, I said, there's gotta be some way we can we can put something in straight and then make a curlicue and like a pig's tail. Only a kosher pig, but a pig tail nonetheless. Um, so anyway, so I worked with some people. We came up with this idea of a curlicue catheter, like a pig tail. 
obviously, that there were variations on the theme. Um, uh, created it, God, God, 18, 20 plus years ago. First generation was kind of a puncture system. Second generation was Seldinger wire. Uh, and along the way, um, heated the, the Heimlich valve and it created some drawings for a modification of the Heimlich valve. Um, smaller, using a hydrophobic material rather than uh, so that it, it didn't stick. It closed, but didn't stick necessarily when blood got in it. it had no latex, which became the, the was going to be the Wayne Newm event came to Cook Newm event because they don't give royalties anymore. They give pr production fee. Uh, so I got a little money. I donated for many years. I got, you know, a couple thousand dollars a year from my royalties for the catheter. And then the last few years got quite a bit before the uh, FDA expiration of royalties. I actually, and I, I don't want to sound like a nice guy because I don't want to get that false impression made, but I did donate. All the last five years was all donated to a, a local charity. Um, in any case, so that was the, that was it. It's on the market. I don't get royalties, but it's a great device. And if I ever get cook off the tush, um, we have two more in, in, in the pipeline, uh, including a smaller pediatric version and a larger adult version. Although the folks at Tucson and then later he's there at USC showed that you could empty blood out of the chest just about as well with this particular material that we, we, we're, our catheter is made out of and, and the vent is made out of. So now let's talk about, because interestingly, my, uh, my battalion chief, while we've been recording, has been texting me about AEDs. And so we've talked about the early evolution of EMS, the early evolution of EM, but you've got a story regarding the early evolution of AEDs. Yeah. So again, don't make me too nice of a guy. Make me a naive gentleman. Um, I was approached in 1974 right after I'd kind of started our EMS system um, by our local pathologist of all people who smoked like a chimney and then died of lung cancer, shock, shock. Um, and he had a couple of buddies in Portland that had this really new, neat device. And um, I, I think I sent you pictures. If I haven't, I can. Um, and they said, well, this device can actually shock, pace, and you know do everything but, but uh, make your lunch. Um, and it would be used portably by non-EMS, well, non-physician, non-paramedics. Um, but they needed somebody to test it because they couldn't get anybody in Portland to be that, maybe euphemistically use the word stupid, to take it out on an EMS vehicle and do it. Now, we were just beginning our system. So the good news is there was no predicate here in the sense that I was taking away from anything because we didn't have ALS, we just had BLS, and we were training the first ALS providers. So they brought this up to me from Portland. They came up, there were, it was Arch Dyack, who was a surgeon, Stan Wilburn, a cardiologist, and Bob Ruhlman, an engineer. And they had this cockamamie idea that instead of cutting people's chests open in the ED, which is what they did that, and that was done to my father. My father had cardiac arrest at 47, went to Sinai Hospital in Detroit, where they opened his chest, they open heart massage. And that's when we thought, oh, it was just the cholesterol in the arteries that caused the problem, didn't understand plaque. Um, and he died. That was the first funeral I ever went to. And obviously had a major impact on my life. But so I said, sounds like an interesting idea. So I brought it up and I said, hey, would you be willing to take this out in the field um, with my little gumball and that went on my car, you know, Kojak light, we called those. Um, and, you know, go out to cardiac arrest calls and try it. So what did I know? Well, I didn't know anything about IRBs. I sure didn't know anything about human use studies. I just knew, hey, this is a cool thing. Let's try it. Now, the interesting part you can add to that, it was an oral or oral airway that had electrodes on it and a microphone. The microphone would sense breathing. The electrodes would provide electrical discharge as one pathway for defibrillation which would theoretically go down the esophagus and the abdominal pad would go at the siphoid. Uh, very interesting pathway. Uh, it also could pace. Now that was the good news. The bad news, it was fully automated. So when you hit that button, it did what it thought it was trained to do. And unfortunately, we had a couple of, I used it in the ER a couple of times and one of the nurses touched, was touching the patient. And this was not biphasic, this was monophasic. So she got her, um, her hackles 
up there after that. She didn't like getting the shock. Um, but so we did it. And, and, and in October of 74, uh, on State Street in Bellingham, I went on a call uh, in one of our condos there, uh, down by the park car. And the gentleman was there and I applied it and it shocked him. Uh, and he got a rhythm back. Um, unfortunately, we didn't really have very good follow-up equipment, so he just got taken to the hospital, because uh, remember, we were just starting our ALS system, uh, and he didn't survive, uh, but he got shocked into a perfusing rhythm. I mean, he got a pulse and a blood pressure, and a lot of things that are there today aren't there then, similar to when my father died. There were things there now that weren't there then. So that was the first use. I did 13 patients. Um, a variety of in the field and in the ED. We had three live three months. Most of these were kind of the nursing home type patient or became nursing home patient. So again, the system was very limited. It showed it could work. And eventually that became a cardiac resuscitator corporation. Uh, I had no real significant financial involvement and uh, walked away with a great deal of satisfaction. Not necessarily a great deal of money, but that's okay. So as I so now when we wrote the original paper, it was it was rejected by major every major journal. I'd like to read the rejection letter again from New England Journal, but I can't find it because all the others involved are deceased. I'm the only person still alive, um, and it basically said you're a bunch of crazy people. Maybe a paramedic, maybe a doctor could use this, but certainly not the lay public. And one of our pr pronouncements it would be like a fire extinguisher on the wall. Isn't that interesting? Ten years later, it finally came to production, uh, other than the CRC's early versions that didn't sell very many. I think Laredal was the first one that bought the rights, and obviously the rest is history. So every time I see a, a defibrillator hanging on the wall next to the fire extinguisher and now next to the blood stopper kits, I go, interesting. So that, that's the AD story, and I've got the original article. Oh, but, oh, we did get published finally. In the, in, I know every one of your listeners listen and read this journal, the Journal of Medical Electronics and Instrumentation in 1979. And obviously that is something that, uh, that we, uh, we, we are proud of. Okay. All right. So AED story. Um, unfortunately, the people that did it, the three of them are now deceased. And unfortunately... They never got the, the acknowledgement that they truly deserved, um, which is a shame. Because, again, this was no I. This was a we that did this. And I was just stupid enough to, to get involved. AD story. That, I mean, that's amazing because you, you mentioned it now, and we've got uh, legislation coming in Kentucky that's going to mandate it every you know, sporting venue for every high school and, you know, any type of sporting events and, and training. And, and it really is around every corner. I still remember the first app about eight to 10 years ago that you could crowdsource the locations of these things. And if you needed one, it would pop it up. And now it's just basically everywhere you see one, you're more surprised when you, when you don't see one. So I, um, I agree. Um, I think, you know, no one knows that history. Um, and actually the original AED, AED, was a device in France, but that was bedside. It was quite large, and it was in case there wasn't any nurses around, it would sense and shock the patients in their uh, ICU, cardiac IC, whatever it was called in those days. And that's 50-something, I think, the original device. We were the first portable device. And again, fire extinguisher next door, blood stopper next door. I always think about that when I look at those pictures. So, hey. You know, I, I'm just really thrilled at the lives that saved, uh, including some people I know um, that were saved by that AED that nobody really wanted to touch and thought we were all crazy people. Well, we were. Let's face it. We didn't understand the potential, or maybe we, they did. I certainly just thought this was, hey, let's, let's try this out and see what it'll do. And then when we didn't go anywhere very much with it, Lots of rejection letters for paper, for the paper. and Medical electronics and instrumentation was the journal. Well, that's the history of major breakthroughs throughout, um, throughout time is your complete quackery until it's, everybody's like, okay, wait, we just accept it as, as given fact. 
And so I can imagine the the smug uh, the smug pen to paper or the typewriter of writing that of these guys and gals don't know anything what they're doing. This is going to be complete foolishness, and it's actually one of the most accessible. Uh, pieces of equipment by uh, medical professionals and the lay public. I mean, in terms of one of the most impactful pieces of intervention that the lay public can do without any medical training. And they were in 1974. Yep. And here we are. So I'm proud of my small participation. Um, and I'm proud of the fact that we proved the concept. And the evolution has been the evolution. It took a while. Now we've got the Aviv, which tells you where it is and uh, where and how to use it. It's gotten smaller and smaller. Got to be careful; then get be too small because it'll kind of disappear. Um, but yeah, no, I mean this is this is an amazing evolution of a device. That think back, 1974, and where are we now? All right, we're going to evolve now because it's not all about medicine. And, you know, we've, we've, it, we've been involved with the pigtail catheter. We've been involved with AEDs. But outside of medicine, if you were a fan of air travel for quite some time, you probably interacted as well. So tell me about how we go from surgery, Vietnam, emergency medicine, EMS, inventions in the healthcare realm to cookies. Um, well, mine crumbled. So, you know, and I was left with that outside the chips, but, um, all right. So the story, Dr. Cookie. So when I was in medical school, uh, in undergrad, one of my many jobs, I was selling vacuum cleaners. Uh, and I also worked in a bakery and it was kind of cool. So, um, I kind of enjoyed that. When I went to Vietnam, I used to, um, how do I put it? You know, a lot of the people, uh, Jack Daniels specials because Jack Daniels was cheap. A um, little bit of um, better living through chemistry, uh, mostly THC. Uh, and um, but I, you know, I kind of was looking for an alternative, so I got to meet some of the the cooks in the mess tent. Most of them were Vietnamese, and they liked to bake. Baking was cool, so I had, you know, had done a little baking uh, in in uh, in. Uh, medical school and, and one of my jobs and went up just to go in and bake, bake with the, with the mess hall people. Probably the highest ranking baker maybe in the army. I don't know. Who knows? Colonel found out about it. You know what he did? He made me bake cookies for him. So, you know, that was the first Colonel I dealt with. The second one didn't think it was a great idea. Um, in any case, I came back to civilian world and I have a buddy uh, who has since passed on Steve Yarnell who is a very famous cardiologist at the University of Washington and in private practice in Seattle area. And Steve and I got together and we're sitting there at a meeting one day and we're looking at famous Amos cookies and then Mrs. Fields. And I said, you know, I've got a much better recipe than those guys do. He said, okay, well, let's try it out. And we did and everybody liked it. And let's have a cookie company. So, you know, na naivete is both your best friend and your worst enemy. Um, so next step, uh, I said, well, yeah, I, you know, I'd seen, I think I saw uh, on one of the airlines, a, a, a cookie of some kind. And I said, gee, we could do better than that. So we, we started this little company. Uh, we started making the cookies by, we had a little front, front row, front door thing in one of the little strip malls down in Ever, Ever or excuse me, Edmonds, Washington. It didn't really have much traffic, unfortunately. So we said, we better figure out another way. So I, Pacific Southwest Airlines, which had the smile on the front, that later became, I think, Delta or whatever. Um, somehow I, I got through to their director of purchasing. Always helps to have a doctor before your name. Hi, this is Dr. Wayne calling. Can I, you know? So I got through to her and I said, hey, I got a really cool little item for your, your airline. And I, I sent her a few cookies. And of course, in those days, we hand scooped them, a little ice cream scoop. We put them in a little bag and we sealed it and put a little stuck on label on it. And we sent her a few and she thought they were really good. And so she said, well, why don't I order a few? Um, the first order was 10,000. Now we have, we're working in a little, you know, storefront in Edmonds, Washington, and we're crank, trying to crank out 10,000. Well, that was good because the next order was 20,000. Anyway, long story short, we, we expanded uh, eventually in 19, 
this was 85. Eight, by the time 91 came, we were producing 13 million cookies a year. We're very line dependent. And if you understand the sigmoid curve, I get to lecture at business schools now about what not to do. The sigmoid curve says as you're going up on the curve, uh, when you get about two thirds of the way up, you either sell, merge, or find an alternative product to su support you or supplement you because you will outstrip your capital. Or if you take a loss, like you lose your customers or something, you have no backup. We proved all of that correct. We got to the top of the curve when we should have already been in process. And then the Gulf War hit. 80% of our business was airline. We lost 60% of our business in 65 days um, because the airline stopped flying. And we came crashing down the other side of the curve. So there was no S to that part. It was just an ass to, part, to that part. Then we tried to figure out what to do. And that was also about the time I'd, Steve and I had done a cookbook. And we went on, I went on a book tour and another story another day. Um, but the bottom line is the cookbook sales were dumped into the company. And to try to make us survive, we dumped a lot of our personal money in. Um, in, in, in 19, see, 94, 93, 94, we were at the crash stage and eventually went bankrupt. So um, I lost a little, about a million dollars, but hey, it's money. And again, no more chips. We were out of dough. Any other, any other uh, uh, thing you want to say? But it was quite a ride. Got to be in People Magazine and Nas even the National Enquirer did a story about us. Um, but uh, for all that was, it was uh, an exciting time. Uh, and, you know, it was fun because we had already start, set up a foundation because we were going to make so much money that we're going to have money to, to give away. And that foundation never really, yeah, it turned into something else. But that's that's way the cookie story went. So am I a renaissance man or am I a fool? Depends which side you're looking on. My wife thinks the, the latter, the fool. Because she gets tired of me pissing away money in crazy ideas. But hey, you know, keeps life interesting. Well, 13 million cookies. I mean, that's not, that's, that's not a little bit. I mean, that's, I mean, of course, now you still, you, you still see it. I mean, that, that would be interesting to say if you had some diversi diversification to survive some of that. And of course, then in 2001 would have been another, you know, significant challenge as well. So as we wrap up talking uh, with Dr. Marvin Wayne, um, we'll, we'll call him the Renaissance man of medicine, earth surgeon slash uh, military Vietnam cook slash surgeon and emergency physician and EMS medical director and then inventor, well, participant in the beginning of the AED with the first episode, the Wayne or the Cook Wayne catheter. Um, any closing thoughts as we wrap up today? Because I think honestly we could do story time for days with, with your life and history and experience. Yeah, you know, my father said something. He was barely educated. I mean, he had high school education. He actually served in the Flying Tigers in World War II. Um, and he said once, he said, if you know, if you make waves, you will hit rocks. But if you never make waves, you will never change the shape of the world. So I would, I would challenge your listeners, if there's still anybody on, um, to, to listen to that and think about that. Don't be afraid to take chances. I've never met anybody who in their final moments of life said to me, I wish I'd, I'd taken fewer chances. Almost everyone said, I wish I'd taken more. And I wish you a thank you, or I give you a thank you for allowing me to uh, have some fun today. Uh, I also admonish our listeners, all of us, every one of us in some small way can be that wave and make a difference. So thank you. Well, I look forward to getting you back on there, maybe even putting together something, uh, an ASAP Frontline Live with story time with some of the, you know, with uh, with yourself and Dr. Bacata and, you know, and, and some of these folks that have been through the evolution of emergency medicine to kind of see where we've been, where we are, some of the cool stories of really uh, living on the edge of, of, our specialty and really where we are. So how can folks get in touch with you if they'd like to ask you any questions, maybe get some recipes? Um, yeah, well, my wife does most of the baking and cooking now, but it's my email is mwayne, M-W-A-Y-N-E, 
and I'm going to spell this, it's Whatcom County, W-H-A-T-C-O-M-C-O-U-N-T-Y, Whatcom County, all one word, dot U-S, or my Gmail, it's a little easier, is M-A-Wayne, M-A-W-A-Y-N-E, and the number two at Gmail. They can feel free to either one. Um, I used to say for a good time, email, but now I've gotten to the age where just having time is important. All right. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks for your time today and hope everything on the West Coast behaves itself. And uh, what people didn't get to experience in this podcast, because now it's all wedged together, was the 10 to 15 minutes in the middle where my Kentucky Wi-Fi decided to shut down and then we couldn't get it rebooted. So this is actually, uh, for this to come together for the 45 minutes that we've come together and talked, uh, we've been on three platforms uh, so far and it's 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 all my fault, and I'm, I'm sure uh, Dr. Wayne could probably have invented something better in that window of time that uh, would have been more consistent. Uh, but as for me, you can contact me, rstandardasap.org, rstandardasap.org, and at Everyday Med on the X Machine. And until next time, I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton, and this has been some ASAP Frontline. If you're not on the front lines, you're on the sidelines. Cue the music. Bam, bam, bam. Bam. Quiet place. All yeah. alone. Da, da, da.